So I'm really pleased to be here to talk about uh, the global challenges of synthetic biology. To those of you unfamiliar with synthetic biology, it's really taking genetic engineering to a new extreme. So instead of the quote unquote old genetic engineering where you would cut and paste uh, genes from between organisms, synthetic biology is the attempt to write genetic code um, and even entire genomes from scratch. Uh, most of the public hadn't heard about synthetic biology until May 2010 when Craig Venter announced the creation of the first ever organism whose genome was completely synthesized by a computer. Um, even though this was, uh, the genome was mostly a copy of a natural goat pathogen, um, it was still a technical breakthrough. Um, but despite that, but despite a lack of public awareness, uh, the field has, had been growing for some time and con continues to grow today, um, mostly without any real oversight or governance of this technology. Synthetic biology is now a global technology and a global industry. DNA is synthesized and sold around the world. People in the do-it-yourself biology movement are able to create organisms with synthetic biology tools in their backyards, and college students are encouraged to create quote-unquote genetically engineered machines um, in a competition run by Drew Endy and some others. Um, and governments, mostly in the US and Europe, are spending millions of dollars in this field every single year. Uh, even so, there are no laws preventing a company from using synthetic organisms that may leak into the environment and no real safeguards to prevent a rogue biologist from synthesizing deadly viruses, um, such as the Spanish influenza or smallpox, both of which have already been synthesized and proven to work in a lab. In the US, the only regulations on the books that are synthetic biology specific are voluntary guidelines for DNA synthesis companies to flag orders that might be used to create, um, to create uh, biological weapons. But again, that's a voluntary measure. Um, the organisms currently being redesigned through synthetic biology are also the most common on our planet. So algae, yeast, viruses, um, E. coli. Craig Venter, for example, is working with ExxonMobil to create synthetic algae that directly produce petroleum. Uh, to highlight some of the environmental concerns posed by synthetic biology, let's take a moment to reflect on just how important algae are to the global ecosystem um, and why it might be a bad idea to let Craig Venter re-engineer re these algae. Algae are ubiquitous and they're found in every biosphere on our planet and they're the base for most of the planet's food chains. Algae are responsible for up to 40% of the oxygen we breathe. In fact, all of us are breathing in algae right now as we sit in this room today. Um, so needless to say, algae are pretty important to all life on Earth and food chains and biospheres. And so picture Craig Venter re-engineering algae with synthetic DNA to produce more oil and in turn less oxygen. Picture that oil producing algae blowing in the wind out of an open pond facility into a worker's lungs or into a local river and picture that algae reproducing every day and flowing into an ocean and swapping genes with wild algae. Uh, these scenarios are all the more troubling since it's impossible to predict how novel organisms will act in the environment, and since our governments see little value in actually assessing these risks before these organisms are produced and released into the environment. Another global challenge um, outside of the environmental release of synthetic organisms is the impact synthetic biology will have on the global economy and what that means for social justice and environmental sustainability. Synthetic biologists envision a future in which our oil-based economy is replaced by a biomass economy. So this bioeconomy will look like this. Synthetic organisms will be created and tailored to break down any type of plant matter imaginable. That means any and all plants could become feedstocks for synthetic bugs to spit out fuels, chemicals, medicines, plastics, what have you. Um, we've already seen the problems that arise from using corn to produce fuel. Um, that's major shifting of food producing land, um, increased food prices, um, dedicating water and fertilizers to produce fuels instead of food. Um, so it's not hard to imagine what could happen when we try to make fuels from not only corn, but any and all types of plants on the planet. So let's picture a world where all the Earth's arable land that was dedicated to food production has shifted to the wide-scale planting of monocultures to feed synthetic organisms, like yeast E. coli. Since land, water, and fertilizer are already in short supply for food production, the pi picture that begins to emerge is not that pretty. Um, Nearly all the synthetic biology corporations, research, funding, and patents are housed in the US and Europe. Um, and at the same time, the vast majority of the plant's biomass, over 86% of the Earth's plant matter in its entirety is in the global south. So the picture would not be one really of sustainability, but rather resource, resource exploitation and a deepening of political and economic injustices by and for the benefit of the rich nations in the north. So if you'll forgive me for a moment for quoting Craig, Craig Venter, um, he said quite proudly, uh, quote, whoever produces abundant biofuels could end up making more than just big bucks. They'll make history. The companies, the countries that succeed in this will be the economic winners of the next age to the same extent that the oil-rich nations are today. 
so this bioeconomy isn't just about producing the next generation fuels. It's really about who will control the future economy. Corporations and northern governments are already gearing up for this battle, and we need to start mobilizing all those concerned in civil society, social movements, indigenous communities, and academia alike. So I guess now for some good news is thankfully there are some opportunities that are arising out of the national and international levels to address these global concerns. One of these is at the UN Convention on Biological Diversity, where this past, past October, 193 parties to the convention uh, voted unanimously, unanimously uh, to urge the use of precau the precautionary approach when dealing with synthetic organisms. And the CBD has also agreed to look uh, further into synthetic biology um, this coming November at the meeting of their scientific and technological review body in Montreal. Um, so this will provide an opportunity to continue, continue to push for a moratorium on the release and commercial use of synthetic or organisms until the proper risk assessments and safety protocols have been established. Another opportunity for engagement is at the upcoming conference on sustainable development, better known as Rio Plus 20. Um, after this meeting, 20 years after the original Rio conventions, there's going to be a major push for a new quote unquote green economy. Um, this green economy is really just another name for the bioeconomy we, we discussed earlier. Um, the supposed green economy will be dependent on synthetic biology and other emerging technologies like nanotechnology and geoengineering. And northern governments and corporations are already actively fighting for this green economy agenda. Um, so civil society and social movements have to begin organizing now to be prepared for this meeting um, next May. Um, and this fight's going to be over not just the future of global environmental governments, but um, who also who will control and benefit from this future bioeconomy. Um, and so I argue that it's crucial for groups to participate in these international fora, partic particularly the groups here today. Um, while the precautionary principle na may not be taken seriously enough in the U.S., it's the cornerstone of the CBD and some other U.N. conventions. Um, one campaign that we're about to launch um, that's going to help us advocate in these arenas is the publication of the Principles for the Oversight of Synthetic Biology. So Friends of the Earth, International Center for Technology Assessment, and some others have been working to draft principles to serve as a collective call from civil society um, for what the pro proper oversight of this technology must look like if it's to move forward in a way that doesn't threaten environmental sustainability, public health, or social justice. Uh, you can learn more about that at one of our workshops that's coming up. Um, and so whether we're talking about attempts to redesign the human genome with synthetic biology, which we'll talk about at this afternoon's working session, um, or attempts to create drugs that go into our bodies or fuels that go into our cars, uh, synthetic biology is a global issue um, that should be a concern to all of us here in Tarrytown. It's only going to become more so of an issue moving forward. So I will just uh, end by seconding Colin's call earlier to move from concerns to campaigns. Um, and use the time here we have this week to come up with campaigns and action steps to begin making the just and human future we're all fighting to see a reality. Thanks so much.